Members, it is now time for questions to the Executive Office, and we will start with a list of questions. And we should add that oral question four has been withdrawn. I now call on Karen Mullen. Karen Mullen, can I call you uh, question one? And I call on the First Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The motion to establish an ad hoc committee on a Bill of Rights was agreed by the Assembly on Monday, the 24th of February. The committee is to submit a report to the Assembly by the 28th of February, 2022. Officials have been liaising with the Assembly authorities and are currently working up options for the appointment of the five expert panel members to facilitate an early ministerial decision. Karen Mullen, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer and ask her to set out the areas of expertise that they will cover. Well, as the member will be aware, um, it's important that this Bill of Rights group sticks to uh, what are the specific areas of Northern Ireland. Um, in the past, there has been some other Bill of Rights processes which have not come to fruition because they became very expansionist. And therefore, it is important that we just deal with the issues. And if we look back to uh, the Belfast Agreement, it talks about the particular issues of human rights which are particular to uh, Northern Ireland. And therefore, we would hope that the uh, uh, appointed experts will take that very much into consideration in any work that they undertake. I call Steve Aiken. Thank, Mayor, thank the, uh, Mayor, thank the First Minister for her comments. I just want to ask her, uh, when we were in the discussions about the setting up of the reform of the Petition of Concern, uh, the First Minister was rightly against the imp expert input from the Human Rights Commission into a reform Petition of Concern. If this is the case, why are you now supportive of their expert input in this case? Well, it's not a case that the Human Rights Commission will be the experts. What we are doing in the Executive Office is uh, asking for uh, people to uh, register their interest, probably by a public appointments uh, process. We will then choose five uh, commissioners or five experts uh, to come forward and to advise the ad hoc committee that has been set up uh, by the Assembly. And then it will be for the ad hoc committee to bring forward a report, as I say, uh, in 2022. And they call on Mark Durkin. I thank the First Minister for her answers thus far. Is or will all party consensus be a necessary precondition for the Bill of Rights? Well, I would certainly hope that we will be able to reach consensus on uh, this important issue. Uh, I think it is right to go forward on that basis because there are many issues uh, that can be discussed in the ad hoc committee. Uh, as he will know, as I have indicated, uh, unfortunately, uh, there was not that consensus in the past, uh, mainly, I think, because uh, we looked beyond what were the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, and it became a very expansionist uh, piece of work. But I think there is more than enough uh, that can be done in relation to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, and I hope that the Ad Hoc Committee will be able to bring that forward in due time. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you, uh, First Minister. Um, I was on the original Bill of Rights in, in 2008, and I met my husband on that, so there was, there was certainly one good thing came out of it. Um, but my question really to you is, what contingency will be in place if there isn't that consensus in terms of, will it fall then to the First and Deputy er, First Minister to veto or um, agree to the contents of the proposals? Well, I do not think we are looking down the road at uh, vetoing proposals. What we are hopeful for is that there will be a consensus that will come forward from the Ad Hoc Committee after consideration of expert advice and after consideration and listening to I am sure they will take advice from a wide range uh, and, and indeed evidence from a wide range of interested parties in relation uh, to this important issue. Uh, issues of poverty, uh, issues which affect people right across Northern Ireland. And I think that uh, the ad hoc committee has a lot of work to do. Um, we hope to be in a position to appoint the expert panel uh, in the near future once we have received official guidance from our officials. Moving on, I am call on Mrs Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number two, please. Uh, the member will be aware that the United Kingdom government has made a commitment in the New Decade New Approach deal to work with the Executive to mark the centenary of Northern Ireland in 2021 and to make available funding to mark the centenary. 
This will include facilitating national recognition and international awareness of the significant anniversary, as well as exploring projects such as the Shared History Fund, the restoration of Craig Avon House and the Great Ulster Forest. Supplementary, Palm Cameron. Thank you, and thank the First Minister for her answers thus far. Would the First Minister agree that uh, the centenary in 2021 could be used as an opportunity to greater promote Northern Irish uh, businesses and local tourism on the international stage? I very much hope that that is the case. We know that um, Scotland in the past has made um, great use of uh, their homecoming event uh, to promote Scotland as a place not just to visit, but also to invest in. Um, I do, uh, like many, I'm sure, look forward to marking the centenary. I recognise, of course, that there are different views and narratives uh, around the centenary of Northern Ireland, uh, but I think it is an opportunity to do, as the member has said, and to uh, encourage uh, investment, to build our economy, and indeed to do more around the tourism product. I call from a con. The market, I'll let, uh, uh, the Minister is aware there are many different narratives around the formation of the Northern State. Uh, this difference of experience will extend to the occasion of the its centenary. How will the Minister ensure that all perspectives are affirmed, accommodated and acknowledged? Well, I think in the past, uh, as the member I think will recognise uh, during the decade of centenaries, there have been uh, appropriate recognition of the different narratives and views, sometimes through lectures, sometimes through symposiums. Um, but I do think it is an opportunity. Um, he uh, will view the centenary, of course, in a different way than I will view the centenary. Uh, I will view it as a, a time of celebration. But I do recognise there are uh, different views and narratives around this issue, and I'm sure that there will be events planned to reflect uh, and to look back on all of those issues. I call Jim Allister. Um, does the First Minister agree that the extent to which the Executive Office is permitted to optimise the celebrations of the centenary will be a telling test of the platitudes of our partner in government when they talk about respect and a shared future. And in that regard, will the Executive Office lobby for the proclamation of an additional public holiday to recognise the centenary? And will the Executive Office seek and support a visit by Her Majesty to this Assembly to address this Assembly on the occasion of the centenary of the formation of the Northern Ireland uh, Parliament. Can the First Minister deliver on those things, or will she be thwarted by the Sinn Féin veto? Well, can I say there's a number of questions uh, in there, Mr Speaker. Uh, in terms of uh, the issue of respect, I hope uh, that as an office, as a joint office, we will be able to show respect to all of the communities here in Northern Ireland. And of course, there will be a lot of us in Northern Ireland who will want to mark the centenary in a very meaningful way and in a celebratory way. Uh, and I think that that uh, is acknowledged. Uh, having said that, I do acknowledge that there are others who take a different view. Um, I'd, in terms of a visit from Her Majesty the Queen, of course, uh, I personally would very much welcome that. I do uh, welcome many royal visitors to Northern Ireland. It is a great privilege of my office to be able to do that. I very recently welcomed the Duchess of Cambridge uh, to Northern Ireland, and I would be absolutely delighted if Her Majesty the Queen uh, was to grace us with her presence uh, during the centenary year, and I would be hugely uh, supportive of that. It is important that we use the centenary in a very meaningful way, that we do not allow it to divide us, but actually to unite us uh, and to look to uh, the next period of time in Northern Ireland when I hope we can build a stronger Northern Ireland economically uh, moving forward for all of our people. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I would like to ask the First Minister what, uh, how far behind does the First Minister think we are uh, compared to preparations for the centenary of the Ulster Covenant? Well, I don't think we're behind at all. And in fact, I think the fact that the United Kingdom government made uh, a number of commitments in the new decade, new approach, indicates that they are wanting to work with us to make sure that we have uh, a centenary marked in the, an appropriate way. Uh, and to make sure that we do it in a way that is uh, inclusive and one that makes a difference for people in Northern Ireland. Uh, as I've said in all of my answers, I do recognise 
that for those of us uh, who value Northern Ireland and its place within the United Kingdom, this is a time of great celebration. But I do recognise that there are other narratives and views in relation to that, and I'm sure that there will be uh, appropriate uh, mechanisms in which everybody in Northern Ireland will be able to have their voice heard. And moving on, I call Andrew Muir. Number three, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Our priority is to ensure that the needs of Northern Ireland are understood and reflected as we move forward. Although political differences exist, the Executive is working together to ensure the best possible outcome for people living here. We are working to ensure that our businesses do not face increased costs, especially in terms of movement of goods north-south or east-west. We are in a unique position here and we have concerns that the interdependencies between the protocol and the trade negotiations are not fully recognised. We have requested a meeting with the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, the Right Honourable Michael Gove MP, where we will raise these concerns. We will also wish to ensure that our economy can flourish. This will require that the United Kingdom Government upholds its commitments to guarantee unfettered access for Northern Ireland businesses to the whole of the United Kingdom internal market and to engage with us on measures to protect and strengthen the UK internal market. Supplementary, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister um, for a response. As she will be aware, um, Europe is watching very carefully to ensure that everyone lives up to their obligations arising from the protocol, which is actually not a backstop, but indeed a full stop. How then does the First Minister reassure the European Union that there will be no bad faith in the context of the view most recently expressed by the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs when he stated he would resist pressure? To implement checks at Northern Ireland ports and had no intention of putting infrastructure in place? Well, I'm sure that the member isn't suggesting that we should fetter the trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and Northern yeah. Ireland to Great Britain, because that, of course, would mean uh, that we wouldn't have a border on the island of Ireland, but that we would have a border between uh, different uh, countries within the same United Kingdom, and that, of course, would be wrong. Uh, and that is why it is important for us uh, to engage with the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster so that we can uh, find out what he means when he says there won't be any barriers, uh, work through all of that. Uh, we are, of course, aware of what the European Union is saying in relation to this matter, but we are very interested to hear what the United Kingdom government has to say on the issue because, of course, they are the negotiating uh, uh, power in terms of Northern Ireland and therefore uh, we need to hear what they propose in relation to the protocol and indeed in relation to our free trade agreements. I call George Robinson. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the First Minister for her view of the United Kingdom mandate for negotiation published last week? Well, as the member, I'm sure the member has read in great detail the United Kingdom's mandate in terms of negotiations, but let me say it is very high level. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I noted uh, when the United Kingdom government's mandate was published that it was crucial uh, that we are involved in the decisions um, that affect directly the people of Northern Ireland and the businesses of Northern Ireland. Uh, and although political differences exist uh, on the issue of leaving the European Union, we are working together as a whole to ensure the best possible outcome uh, for the people living here. And we need to have our voice heard, and that is why the Deputy First Minister and I have requested an urgent meeting with the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster so that we can raise our concerns uh, and so that we are heard to make sure that there isn't um, costs put on our businesses and indeed costs that could then be transferred to our consumers. We want to make sure that we have the answers to that and that's why that meeting with uh, Right Honourable Michael Gove uh, MP is very important. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, First Minister, we've heard conflicting and contradictory things from different parts of the UK government regarding unfettered access for uh, Northern Ireland to Great Britain mar markets, and also contradictory um, things about the upholding of the protocol, which was signed and is now binding in a, legally, in a treaty that is legally held at the United Nations. Given that, will the First Minister agree with me that by far the best outcome for Northern Ireland from these trade talks between the UK and EU? is the closest possible relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union, and will she and the Deputy First Minister make those representations on behalf of Northern Ireland? Uh, can I say to the member, and thank him for his question, that the, the best possible outcome, of course, is a free trade arrangement between 
uh, the United Kingdom government and the European Union. That, of course, would do away uh, with the protocol that's currently there uh, and would mean that we would have that free trade uh, between the European Union and ourselves right across the United Kingdom. So we will work uh, with the government to try and achieve that. Whether the European Union is interested in that is another matter, but certainly that is where the government wishes to go, uh, and I certainly, for one, will support them in doing that. I call Emma Sheeran. Thank you, Carla. Thank you to the Minister for earlier answers. North-South trade is vital for our economy. It's worth billions of pounds uh, in goods and services. Could the Minister outline how the protocol will address concerns about the cross-border provision of tradable services and the sharing of data across the island? Well, services uh, are, isn't covered by uh, the protocol. Um, it's uh, something that we do very much want to see dealt with so that the services that continue east, west and north, south can uh, continue. Of course, the uh, Republic of Ireland is an important uh, destination uh, for our goods and services, uh, but the Great Britain market is uh, by far the largest market for our goods and services, and in 2017 that was worth £24.6 billion uh, to the Northern Ireland economy uh, in comparison to £6.5 billion uh, with the Republic of Ireland. So it is very important that we have all of those relationships, north, south and east, west, dealt with in a way that doesn't do damage to our economy but actually uh, helps those in our economy who want to grow. I call Meg Nesbitt. The uh, First Minister agree with me that it is a matter of regret that we don't have a Northern Ireland specific uh, shortage occupancy list as recommended by the Migration Advisory Council as early as May of last year uh, and would she call on her colleague in the Department of the Economy to rectify the situation as a matter of urgency. Well, as I understand from the recent announcement by the Home Secretary, she has agreed to a uh, Northern Ireland shortage uh, list, and therefore that will be coming forward now. That announcement, as he will know, has only very recently been made. Uh, we support the fact that there is that shortage occupation list, uh, and we will want to make sure that it is populated uh, in the most timely manner that we can. We would like it to be an iterative list so that it's something that can change over time as, as opposed to being stuck in time, Mr Speaker. Uh, and certainly the Department for Economy will be working uh, with the Home Office uh, to make sure that that list is put in place. Moving on, I call Keeve Archibald. I got Can Corlea, Kest over, or over Craig. Question five, please. Uh, work to develop this strategy is underway. We are drawing on the excellent work, knowledge and experience that has been gained from successfully resettling a significant number of people under the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. A two-day innovation lab about the long-term integration of refugees is being held with stakeholders next month, and the outcome will inform the final strategy, which will, of course, be fully consulted upon. Keeve Archibald, supplementary. Um, and I, I thank the, the Minister for her response. Um, there are, are organisations like Red Cross and Bernardo's who have been doing excellent work supporting refugees and asylum seekers. And as the Minister outlined, the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Scheme ha has really um, informed the work that is being undertaken. Um, I was wondering if the, the Minister could give a further um, outline of the expected time frame for the consultation. <coughs> Well, as I said, there's an innovation lab going to take place and uh, that will inform uh, the strategy moving forward. I think that is a, a new and innovative way to look at uh, our strategies and I welcome the fact that that is being done. Um, the Syrian uh, scheme has worked very well. I well remember the very first Syrian refugees that came to Northern Ireland in October 2015 um, and I and the then Deputy First Minister went and welcomed them uh, to Northern Ireland and it is great to see so many have integrated right across Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, not just uh, in pockets but actually right across Northern Ireland and to date there are 1818 um, 1818 refugees have been received here and uh, I think the two day innovation lab will look at how we can plan for the long term integration of refugees, um, how we can enter uh, how we can interact with stakeholders, groups that do help them. We've mentioned the Red Cross, there are many other groups as well. Uh, and that outcome will inform the final refugee integration strategy, which of course, as I've said, will be fully consult consulted upon. Um, but I think there's a new way of doing things and one which I welcome. 
I call Phil Philip McGuigan. Deborah Shea, question number six. Uh, the Victims Payment Scheme policy and legislation was designed in Westminster. We are jointly of the view that this uh, scheme should be funded from Westminster and we are continuing to make that case. The Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme will provide much needed support for those who have been left with life changing injuries as a result of a Troubles related incident. It is not possible for the cost of the scheme to be absorbed into existing budgets. And the Finance Minister has met with Her Majesty's Treasury and noted that the source of funding must be confirmed urgently. Uh, just given the, or thank the, the Minister for her uh, answer and just given the answer uh, to the question, can I ask her uh, what discussions uh, she has had with the NIAO to ensure that they meet their obligation for the victims' payment scheme? Well, this will be a continuing conversation uh, with the NIO. I have only uh, briefly met um, with the new Secretary of State um, just for about 20 minutes, and it was a party-to-party -party basis. It wasn't a, in, in terms of the joint office. Um, so we will be seeking to meet with uh, the new Secretary of State in relation to this matter, because normally a business case setting out estimated costs would be developed alongside the policy and the legislation. Um, and as this work has not been undertaken, the, t the, the executive office are now having to uh, work on that to develop the likely costs. And I know uh, that some colleagues in the TEO committee are uh, questioning the costs and are asking about the costs, but we are having to try and work out the costs um, without a business case and to try and make guesstimates as to where we are going to be in relation to these issues. So we will continue to engage with the NIO. I call on Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, like um, the First Minister, share concerns about where the money is coming from. But can I ask the First Minister, um, has there been any discussions as to which department will take forward this scheme, given the fact that it is a pension scheme, effectively a pension scheme? Yes, it is a, effectively a pension scheme, and there have been some initial uh, discussions, um, I think, involving, and I don't have the briefing in front of me, but I think involving the Department for Communities and the Department for Justice. Those two um, uh, uh, um, ministries have been involved in, in terms of the initial discussions, but these are all the sort of issues that we really have to get to grips with very quickly, actually, if we want this scheme to be up and running within the appropriate timescale. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure, First Minister, you'll share my enthusiasm that we have at last got something in relation to innocent victims and survivors. Um, but in relation to that, when do you think, I mean, some of the questions is focused on budgetary uh, aspect of that, but when do you think the first payments to the innocent victims will start rolling out? Well, I think we have a timescale, um, and the aim is to implement this by the end of May of this year. Uh, but I have to say, Mr Speaker, that is a very challenging timescale. Of course, officials uh, will work to try and, and to deliver on that. Uh, we anticipate about 2,000 recipients, but again, we're not clear until people start coming forward uh, when the scheme opens. Uh, the payments will be between £2,000 and £10,000 uh, per annum, um, but due to backdating, uh, costs will be initially uh, high uh, and then will uh, taper off into a, a certain level. So we do have a lot to do in relation to this scheme, but as I said in my substantive answer, we jointly take the view that this, because this is a Westminster policy, this has been designed at Westminster, that the funding should come um, from Westminster in order to deal with this issue. And I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, um, Minister. As you know, that many of the, the innocent victims and survivors um, suffer psychological injury, uh, and some of them have been told they will not be eligible to this scheme because they were not present when their loved one uh, was murdered. Um, can I ask if you will engage with the Victims and Survivors Service to clarify this issue and ensure that the information they are giving out uh, does not meet that? Well, the eligibility, again, if I can say to the member, has been set uh, by the Westminster Government. Uh, my officials are working through those eligibility issues uh, at the moment, and he has mentioned one uh, which I know will be uh, of concern uh, to many. Um, and indeed, uh, we are looking at whether that is something uh, that can be dealt with uh, in a discretionary way by the board. But I say this is all at very early development stage. Um, I'm sure. 
that the Victims and Survivors Service will be happy to engage uh, with any of the groups or indeed individuals who want to come forward to make representations in relation to the matter that he has raised. Nicole, Ms. Olia Flynn. Yeah, uh, Kesht, ever a shot. Question number seven, please. The Together Building a United Community strategy published in May of 2013 reflects the Executive's long-term commitment to building a more united and shared society. The New Deal new approach reaffirmed our continued support for this strategy. Supplementary, Orlea Flynn. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for her response. I know that in my own constituency in the colliery of West Belfast, um, that they've benefited greatly through the Urban Villages Initiative within the T-Box strategy. So it's just a question to ask the Minister, does she believe the delivery of the T-Box strategy is improving community relations? Well, I absolutely do. And I mean, it's sometimes hard to quantify the impact that the T-Box strategy has had, because of course it's difficult to measure uh, when people are, are integrating in, in a more uh, serious way than they have done in the past. But I have to say, we have made significant progress over uh, a range of headline actions. You have mentioned urban villages. Um, Collins, one of those urban villages. East Side, uh, Ardoin and Ballysillan, uh, the markets, Donegal Pass and Sandy Row, and then of course the Fountain and the Bog Side uh, in Londonderry. And those have all had a, a lot of funding put into them, and I think there's been a lot of progress made in all of those areas. Uh, we do, of course, then have the T-Buck Camps programme, where over 20,000 young people have taken part in 570 camps since 2015, uh, and that has been a huge success as well with all of those uh, young people. Uh, we have the 10 shared neighbourhoods, and that, of course, is a housing uh, project, uniting communities through support uh, and creativity. Uh, and then the Peace for Youth programme, uh, which is working there as well. One of the areas, Mr Speaker, where we'd like to see more progress on is the Shared Education Campuses programme, and we know that that has taken a little bit more time than we would have liked it to take, but we hope that there will be progress made in that in the near future. And I call Justin McNulty. And can I thank the First Minister for her answers thus far? I'd like to ask the First Minister, um, a few weeks back I was lucky to be at the T-Buck United Canadian Communities Through Sport event in the Armagh City Hotel, attended by Ulster GA, the IFA, IRFU um, and the Peace Players amongst others. Can you give your assessment of how successful that programme is? And are there any plans to continue or expand funding to that programme? Well, certainly we intend to, as I understand it, continue with the programme. I'm very pleased that the member had the opportunity to go down and to see the programme for himself, because I think maybe sometimes members hear about programmes in the House and they don't actually experience the way in which it is making a difference, uh, particularly to young people. So I'm pleased to hear that you've taken the opportunity to go down uh, yourself uh, and to see what goes on. So the com Uniting Communities Through Sport and Creativity is really using sport, uh, physical and creative activity to break down divisions uh, and to deliver good community relations. And, you know, it's not about saying uh, that something isn't for me or that doesn't belong to my community, so I'm not going to engage in it. It's actually allowing people to be proud of uh, their particular um, sport uh, and to come along to share their pride with other young people who maybe have never engaged in that sport before. And I think that that is uh, something that is really positive and really good and we hope that it's going to continue. John Blair with one minute on the clock. S Speaker, uh, thank you. Can I thank the First Minister for answers to this point also? Uh, given, Speaker, the need to, to uh, address the needs of all communities, not just two communities, can I ask if the uh, previous T-Box strategy will be subject to independent audit and assessment? Well, I'm sure, like all of our programmes, it will be subject to independent audit. Um, again, it's a, if, if we're looking, sometimes it's difficult to put in to value for money terms the impact that these sorts of schemes will have had on their different communities. I do agree with them, of course, not just about the two communities, it's about our newcomer communities as well, and making sure that they uh, feel integrated and that there is an increase in respect for each other, uh, an increase in shared space that people feel comfortable with and an increase in reconciliation, which I think is what we all want to see. That ends the period for listed questions, and I'm moving on to topical questions. Topical question number eight has been withdrawn, and I now call Pat Cadney. 
Um, I'm glad uh, for the response from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to my question that was written and uh, asking about and recognising the potential of the Mays Long Cash. I'm aware that there is no agreement on the future on the site, but given the fact that you recognise its potential, can the First and Deputy First Minister tell me if she has had any conversations with each other, with the other Deputy or Vice Versa or the, first, or the Deputy First Minister about trying to find an agreement on the future of the May's long cash? Well, as the member has recognised himself and has said, uh, we do absolutely recognise the potential of the site. I think previous ministers before us in this office recognise the potential of the site as well. And we hope to see a resolution so that the site can be developed. And I know it's something... Uh, that his city council are very, uh, keeping a very tight eye on, uh, and they will want to see that. But of course, the timeline for development will depend very much on whether we can reach a resolution around the issues that are there on the site. Huge issues. So he will be aware of the history of this site and what happened, uh, but it is important that we try and move forward. Supplementary, Pat Catnick. Um, First Minister, is it fair for me to ask then that both yourself and the Deputy uh, First Minister make a commitment to having a conversation about the future of this site, again on the economic corridor and where it's situated, and yes, taking into place the historical significance of where it is? Thank you. Well, yes, we will be having conversations uh, around the site because, as we have acknowledged, um, there is a huge potential for the site. Um, it's whether we can find a way through what are very difficult issues, and I think it's important that all of the stakeholders are brought along with us in relation to that issue. I think what happened on the last occasion was that people felt that they weren't involved in terms of the development of the site, and they felt excluded, and they were concerned about what was going to happen at the site. So I think um, there's very much a case for it being a very inclusive discussion, uh, and one that brings everybody along with us if we can. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answers so far. What actions uh, have been taken to see progress on the UK government commitments in the new decade, new approach? Well, as the member will know, there are a large number of commitments uh, made by the United Kingdom government uh, in new decade, new approach. Uh, we've mentioned some of them today around the centenary, but there are also uh, commitments uh, around previous agreements. There's also commi economic commitments, financial commitments, um, and we will be engaging with the Northern Ireland Office to take forward uh, those commitments to make sure that they are delivered on. Supplementary, Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And can I ask the, the First Minister, does, does she share my view that early delivery of these issues will build confidence and help stabilise the Assembly and the Executive? Yes, I absolutely do agree with that. I mean, I think it's important. We have, uh, as an executive, tried as far as we possibly can to deliver on what um, was allotted to us um, in the new decade, new approach. Uh, and we have here today a debate on the legislative programme, for example, which was to be brought in a particular time, and we tried to make sure that that happened. So I think it's incumbent uh, upon the United Kingdom government to make sure that they carry through on their various commitments that they've made uh, to Northern Ireland, um, uh, which are contained in Annex A of the New Decade, New Approach, so that we can all move forward and stabilise the Assembly and Executive. Mr Keith Buchanan. Hey, thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask the First Minister to give an update on the work of her the own department and the Executive colleagues in relation to the coronavirus and the, on the way it's developed over this past few days? Yes, I'm very pleased to tell the House, uh, Mr Speaker, that we've had a very close working relationship with the Minister of Health uh, over, actually, since this became an issue uh, around the coronavirus. Um, on Saturday, uh, the Deputy First Minister, myself, and the Health Minister held a conference call with uh, the Taoiseach, um, his <coughs> Minister for Health, and the Chief Medical Officer uh, in the Republic of Ireland, because, of course, um, in terms of our designated case now that came through uh, Dublin Airport. So we did want to make sure that uh, the protocols were working, that were put in place, and they are. 
Uh, it's very good to hear that. Um, but also to make sure that we have that close cooperation and continued uh, conversations about this issue as time moves on. Keith Buchanan, supplementary. Thank you so far for your answer, First Minister. And with respect to COBRA, can you give us an update how the joint up approach between the Northern Ireland Government, all our regions and COBRA are all linked together? Yes, so as well as speaking um, to colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, we also uh, joined a COBRA conference call today uh, with the United Kingdom uh, Government, the Scottish Government, uh, the Welsh Assembly and uh, Deputy First Minister myself, the Chief Medical Officer uh, and the Minister for Health. And I'm sure when the Minister of Health comes to give his urgent uh, oral later on, he will give more details of that. But suffice to say, uh, it is important that we continue uh, to support the Health Minister and all of our executive colleagues because this is becoming an issue not just for him but for the whole of the executive actually as to how we move forward and earlier on today our civil contingencies was put in place. It has now uh, been called together and is in operation uh, because we want to make sure that the executive is ready to deal with whatever comes to us in relation to COVID-19, the coronavirus. Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the uh, First Minister what plans does the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have to address this Assembly about any issues arising from the RHI report once it's published on Friday the 13th? Well, as I understand it, uh, the report will go to the Department of Finance. Um, I'm not sure whether it goes to the Department of Finance on Thursday or Friday. Uh, Mr. Justice Coughlin uh, is, I understand it, making an announcement then in the afternoon of the 13th. Um, we will then, of course, uh, consider that report, and I further understand that the Minister of Finance will uh, come to this place and answer any questions in relation to that. Andrew Muir, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does the First Minister not agree that it is important that the first comments and response from the leaders of our government will be in this place and to be able to answer questions from MLAs in this chamber? Well, as the, as the member knows, um, this matter is the property. Uh, it is a public inquiry entirely independent of government, uh, but the finance minister, is the, uh, when he was in post, was the person who gave the terms of reference and who asked for this inquiry. Therefore, it is important that he is given his place because it's, uh, the report will come back to the Department of Finance. Um, I am sure there will be ample opportunity, Mr Speaker, uh, for myself, the Deputy First Minister, and indeed anybody else, uh, to answer questions in relation uh, to the inquiry, uh, as it is quite uh, a long report, I understand, although having no knowledge uh, of what is coming forward in relation to a wide range of issues, I'm sure we will be before this House answering questions in relation to that matter. I call Paul Frew. And I thank the First Minister's uh, questions on the uh, provisions for veterans in Northern Ireland uh, so far. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions and consultations has she had and the executive had with the British government in order to determine time frames and processes that need to be set out for the implementation of those provisions in Northern Ireland? Yes, there is a wide variety of matters which are not the responsibility of the executive but are the responsibility of the United Kingdom government in relation to the issues that the member raises. Therefore, we will want to uh, ensure swift delivery. Uh, we welcome the commitment by Her Majesty's Government uh, and indeed the Ministry of Defence uh, to work with us, but we will need to see time scales and structures put in place and we will be working to ensure that those come forward as quickly as possible. Paul Farouk, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Can I ask, since the military covenant and the other provisions talked about have to be implemented by executive departments? Given the public utterances by some Sinn Féin members stating that they do not support the implementation of the Armed Covenant, how can the Executive assure me that the Armed Forces Covenant will be implemented and the veterans of Northern Ireland will receive the provisions which they deserve? The member knows the uh, Veterans Commissioner um, will be appointed by uh, Her Majesty's Government. Uh, it will be the w part of the work of the Veterans Commissioner to make sure the veterans' voices are heard at the heart of government here in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. So I see that appointment as a very important appointment to give voice uh, for veterans, and we look forward to that appointment being made in the near future. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. 
Can the First Minister look the people of Northern Ireland in the eye and tell them why, in her view, they need Irish language and other such legislation at a cost of £11 million a year, more than they need an extra 275 nurses that such expenditure would obtain? Of course, it's not an either-or situation, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I think he well knows that the New Decade New Approach uh, was something that was come to uh, by the government and it was a basis for moving forward. Uh, and indeed, the costs that have been set out, and which I know have been the subject of much discussion here and in committee, are only a marker. Uh, because, of course, uh, it is my expectation that the actual costs uh, will prove much less. Uh, the reason those costs have been put forward is that they are an estimate. Um, they have, been, they have ar been arrived at by looking at uh, other commissioner offices to see uh, what way things can move forward. And they've been, the officials have been working on the basis of comparisons with bodies such as uh, the Human Rights and Equalities Commissions. And I don't think that that would be necessarily reflective uh, of the offices that we're talking about putting in place. So therefore. Um, I think his worst fears will not be realised, and maybe he'll be very disappointed about that. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary, Jim Allister. The First Minister says they are only estimates. They are her estimates. They are estimates that her officials, on her behalf, placed before the Executive Committee, and they are the only estimates we have. And it is not surely true to say that it is not an either-or. They are resource money. Therefore, a choice is made. Do you spend £11 million on extra nurses as a resource, or you do you spend it on the do you squander it on Irish language? That's the choice that the first minister is making. Well, I have to say that there are many things that I would not spend money on uh, in Northern Ireland, and unfortunately, we have to spend it because uh, there is a commitment to do that. Um, and I have to say, it's not just about the Irish language. There's also a British commissioner there. And I'm disappointed that the member doesn't think it's worthwhile having a, a, a commissioner to enhance British identity here in Northern Ireland. I certainly think that it will be a good thing uh, for those of us from uh, a British identity to have that put in place. And then the offices of identity, the office which is there to try and deal with some of the issues that have developed over this past number of years and actually to also help those newcomer communities to come into Northern Ireland. And can I remind the member that it was a minister on this side of the House that brought about more nurses' places uh, for Northern Ireland over that period of time. More nurses were put in place, and he shouldn't play politics with nurses. I think it's very, very, very poor form indeed. But, but, but the member will continue to do what he always does. OK, I call uh, Pat Sheehan. Uh, could the minister give an indication of the, the uh, estimated costs for Westminster's uh, victims payment scheme? And could you tell us who's going to carry the burden of that cost? Uh, the member may not have been in the House when I answered this question earlier, but uh, this is again a guesstimate. Uh, and it's based uh, on the fact that we haven't been able to develop a business case alongside the policy and legislative development because it was policy and legislation developed at Westminster. We are now trying to put in place uh, a guesstimate for uh, the committee, um, and we're doing that as best we can, but recognising that it will only be a guesstimate at this stage. Pachi and Supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, and if, if the First Minister would take account of previous payouts and, and use them as comparators, so for example, the PSNI hearing loss claim at the moment is running somewhere between 160 and 180 million, and the estimates for the HIA compensation scheme are uh, upwards of 600 million, would the First Minister agree with me that the payout for the the victim payment scheme is likely to be much more than that? Well, as I've indicated to the member, our estimate of costs are high level at present. Um, we do need much further refinement, but we're basing it on 2,000 recipients coming forward in 2020 2021. Uh, which will amount to 25 to 16 million in implementation costs, and then for the purposes of financial planning, we've assumed a cost of 109 million 
uh, including implementation costs over the three-year budget period. So we have uh, put that forward to the committee. I know it's frustrating for the committee that we don't have actual costs based on a business uh, case, but that's as best as we can do in the circumstances. And time is up. We now move to questions to the Minister for Agriculture. I call Emma Sheeran. Sorry, the Minister for Infrastructure. <laughs> 